Welcome to our third and final installment of our Jacksonville, Illinois documentary series sponsored by the Jacksonville Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. On this third and final day in Jacksonville, we woke up in the beautiful Blessings on State and enjoyed breakfast. We also got to chat with Miss Gwen. You'll get to hear from her in a video all about the B&B, but here is a funny little sneak peek. Make sure everything was the way we wanted it. I went in the sleeping room, the bedroom. I went in the bathroom. I went in the sitting room. I was back in the bathroom and I heard them come in the door. <laughs> I didn't know which way to run. I mean, it was like, I felt like, I love Lucy. It was like if there was a drop down ladder for a fire escape, I'd have been going out that sitting room. And I, I couldn't hide under the bed because it's a trundle. <laughs> and I just, I didn't know what to do and I'm in the bathroom. And there, and I hear her say, oh, just rip it. Oh, here's And I think, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. After breakfast, it was time to get active with a golf lesson at Fitness World's Golf Simulator because it was a little too cold for the course. Bless Derek's heart for putting up with us, y'all. He was awesome. Uh, normally it's at the golf course, but I usually have 15 or 20 juniors and, and I have some other adults that come in and we're working on getting leagues in here um, and having golf leagues and all that stuff. So. We want to move these out to the golf course and build a maintenance building, uh -huh. uh, so that or a uh, Morton building, that we can have that all this in there, and because we have sand volleyball too out of Case Creek, oh. and bags and everything else, and we do dinners out there, so we don't want sand volleyball players coming in during dinner time. Gotcha. So, but yeah, Case Creek has a lot of stuff going on, so it's not just a golf course. It's, I mean, it's. <laughs> I mean, it's packed. We only had an hour, and we are the definition of golf newbies. Like, we are not good, y'all. That's it. <laughs> and by the end, we could already see an improvement. If you stand over there, okay, shake hands, shake hands. Should go straight. Uh huh. Good. Yeah. Well, and so you pulled your hands through, okay. okay? So when you shake hands, pull it with your body and let your hands just fall down, okay? Let them fall down. <laughs> this is, it's all right. You can actually pull the club up when you shake it hands up higher, right there, okay? Yeah, yeah, you want to get almost shoulder high. Yep. There, good. Yep. Yep. Okay, again, so you picked it up, let it go. Down. Okay. Yep. Well, that's, kind of scary. <laughs> that's what I, I wondered. I was looking at this. Okay, so your left hand is on top. Your right hand is on the bottom. Oh. There you go. Oh, that feels yeah. Much better. Yeah. Well, I was like, something doesn't look right, and I'm standing here. I go, no, it's right. Then I turned around. And I was like, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. There we go. There we go. Hey. Now we're good. <laughs> you, I, there would have been no way to go any further than this. Okay. Do you start right up against it or Yep, it? yep, right up against it. There we go. Ooh, buddy. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Yay! <laughs> Anytime you hit the ball is a victory. Okay. That's what I always say for a lot of people. <laughs> it felt a whole lot different too with my hold of my hands the right way. Look at that. 
Hey. Yeah. And see, so I look at this. That's perfect. I mean, that's what your club path is. That perfect is 0, 0.0, obviously. So you're really close to. A lot of times I see those numbers and I see like six point this and seven. So. Okay. You're a natural. Oh my. <laughs> they'll get here and they'll stop. Well, then you can't get the ball going as far as you want, and you can't. Anytime you stop, your hands are going to go this way. So, watch the hips. The hips turn, and then the club comes through. Everything comes together. Okay, nice and easy. Up, hinge, all the way through. Good stance. I like that. Good. Your body position's good. Hinge. Aha! Aha! Okay. That's okay. Close. Just down more. Swing look fine. Look, you're better. Club face is closer. So that just means you hit it right here. Okay, your eyes came off of it. Okay. Yep. You, okay. I always tell people, pick a spot. This is how f technical I am. I look at one of those dots. That's it. I color a dot and I literally look right there the whole time. So now you're going to stare at that two. Okay. Don't leave that two until it leaves. Okay. Yes. There we go. There we go. It's okay. Launch 21, that's good. Oh, look at this. That's the one. 56 yards. Oh, then you got anxious and pulled up. Remember, don't pull it. Okay. okay, so instead of wrapping it around your body more, more up and up here. Okay. Yep, because we go here and then it goes flat and you can't get that angle okay. to come straight back up and down. Okay. There you go. Uh -oh. It's all right, it's all right. <laughs> so, how is it supposed to feel when I go? That's what I'm gonna show you. Okay. All right, so, as you take your practice swing, as you slowly come back, shake hands. shake hands with me, and then from there, there, oh. yeah, ah. yeah, because what happens is you get to turning, but you don't get those hands up, and it probably feels awkward, and you probably feel like you're leaning back because you're coming more here, instead of just letting it go naturally up here, okay, okay? and then down. Because if the flatter you come back, the flatter it comes in. You want to come with a steep, so it just goes like this. So you're here, okay? Okay. Now, keep your elbow in. Oh, okay. There, okay. yeah. And then what you'll do is come right back down on top of it, okay? okay? And then up and then down. That That's good right there. Oh. Okay, now do it all in one motion. Okay. Oh. It's all right. Hey, you're again you're trying to do everything with your arms. Remember, it's your body. body. Okay. Turn your body. See now look at you looking better. <laughs>
now down. There you go, good. And it takes a while to figure out your body turning. Derek was so incredibly patient and was an awesome teacher. If the weather hadn't been freezing, our lessons would have been at Case Creek, which is one of the gorgeous golf courses in Jacksonville. Oh, look at me. After working up an appetite, we dropped into Burger Board for some of the best burgers around. We have the best food. I am too old to put out old bad food. <laughs> so, um, I'll tell you some of the things that we have that you might want to think about ordering. Okay. First of all, we do a wonderful horseshoe. We make our own cheese sauce. Do you know what that is? Two pieces of bread and two patties, two hamburger patties with french fries over the top of it uh, and coated in cheese. Sauce. So it's, it's, that's really good. Uh -huh. We have a wonderful pepper jack burger. We make our own chili. We have great chili. So uh, it's not uh, packaged food that you see. We make every order fresh to order. Joni B and I both opted for the pepper jack burger. And holy crinkle fries, y'all, it was delicious. Brittany from the Jacksonville CVB also shared her fried portobellos with us, and they were pretty dang tasty. After lunch, we started our historical tour around Jacksonville. Our first stop was the Governor Duncan Mansion, which is one of the only standing governor's mansions in the state of Illinois, besides in the capital of Springfield. The home is kept up by the local Daughters of the American Revolution chapter. They're usually able to fundraise by hosting an annual ice cream social, renting the home out for events like weddings, and giving tours for donations. But this year, that didn't happen. No fundraising, and the heat bills aren't going to go away. So it's, it's really a difficult time, I think, for a lot of, of nonprofits and museums and groups. But that certainly hasn't stopped the DAR from giving their all to this mansion. We bought the house in 1920 from the descendants of the Duncans. And the house was built in 1833, so it's quite old, 187, I think, I believe, if my math is right. Um, so it was uh, built by Joseph and Elizabeth Duncan. Uh, he served as the sixth governor of the state of Illinois. He was the fifth elected governor. The, fifth, the first governor is always appointed. Okay. Uh, he was a Whig, as was Lincoln. They were contemporaries. Um, you, you, we don't have piece of paper that says Lincoln was in this house on such and such a day, but right. we really believe that he was. Um, Governor Duncan was um, first served um, in Congress for Illinois, um, and then uh, before that he came up to uh, Illinois from Kentucky, Paris, Kentucky. And it's kind of funny, but the, uh, his home there is now a, um, the Duncan Tavern and it's also owned by a DAR chapter. This house is filled with some beautiful history of patriotism and love, but I don't want to sit here and jabber on about it. Our tour guide Susan tells the stories much better, so take it away. The DAR didn't have the money to purchase the house, so what they did was sell you a place on the marble slab for $100, and you could put the name of your first relative to come to Morgan County and the date that they came. Now, Mrs. Duncan was only four feet six inches tall. Uh, so a lot of what you will see in the home is smaller to accommodate her, which is, it was rare. We have their diary and uh, it's very much a love match. She'll talk about how he would carry her out to the carriage when it snowed so she wouldn't get her slippers wet. She has in her stories, in the diary, she will talk about how she would make a meal for her family and the local Indians would come by and eat it and then she'd have to make something else. Um, she would bake a cake and put it on the porch to cool, and the wolves would lick the icing off. I said, this was wilderness, and she was not raised in that, no. So this was quite a shock for her to come to Illinois. So um, the mansion was primarily built with her funds. 
Unfortunately, Governor Duncan dies very young, um, unexpectedly. He had made some loans to some friends uh, who defaulted, and Mrs. Duncan really suffers financially pretty much for the rest of her life. And it's hard for her to keep up the mansion. Uh, comes a point in time where she rents the mansion to the state of Illinois and it becomes the home for feeble-minded children. And in some of the library books that we have that were the Duncans, you can see the scribbling where the kids got a hold of the books. It's really kind of neat. Um, they met at a dinner party at the White House given by President John Quincy Adams. As I said, Governor Duncan at the time was Congressman Duncan. Um, Mrs. Duncan's dad was one of the founders of the New York Stock Exchange. She was a New York debutante. She was very rich. Uh, she came with a dowry that if you were to convert it to money today, roughly $4.2 million. So when the Duncans lived here, this would have been two rooms. There would have been a wall across here with pocket doors. The gentleman over the fireplace is Governor Duncan. And the lady over this fireplace is his wife, Elizabeth. And she talks about her in her diary what she wore the night to the dinner party at the White House. And it's an exact description of that dress. Now, we didn't get that particular portrait uh, until 2010. Oh, wow. And I think that's right. The Duncans had 10 children. Ten. Can you imagine that little teeny lady? <laughs> Ten children. Only three of them actually lived to be adults. Uh, Elizabeth had a daughter, Julia, a daughter, uh, Mary Louisa, and a son, Joseph Jr., that all three survived. What do you feel as you walk up? What am I supposed to do? Well, when you go up the bed and breakfast stairs. They creak. Yeah, but how much more f do you have to raise your foot? These are short risers. Mrs. Duncan was little, so they built this house to accommodate her. So anytime you see this little letter D, that means that that was an actual piece that belonged to the Duncans. And this was Mrs. Duncan's piano, brought from New York. It's a chittering. Um, there's a show on television the restoration guy outside of Las Vegas, Rick something. Anyway, he redid a chittering and uh, valued it at over $80,000. This one has not been redone. Way off the ground, isn't it? Yeah, and the steps so she could get in. He actually died in this bed. And this was Julia's bedroom, and we know that because she writes of how she could sit in her bedroom and look out the window at the formal gardens. The entire width of the house on this side is a dormer room. We believe that that was the children's nursery. There's weight equipment on this end, and when the feeble-minded children were here, the idea was that if you exercise the body, you exercise the mind and he would pack up his, his trunk and be gone for days at a time. And when he would come home, and you know how we are, honey, while you were gone, Joseph Jr. <laughs> well, when he got tired of listening to her, he picked her up and put her on the mantle and left her because she couldn't get down by herself. She had to wait for one of the servants or one of the kids to come to get her down. After our incredible tour of the Duncan Mansion, it was time to make our way to another historic landmark in Jacksonville, Woodlawn Farm. The home was owned by the Huffaker family. It was settled in 1824 with the intention of simply being the home of Michael Huffaker and his family, sort of pioneers for the area. But it soon turned into something much more mysterious. 
If the walls of this home could talk, we would know so much more about the work the Huffakers did for African Americans escaping slavery on the Underground Railroad. But all we really have is a story told by the Huffakers' granddaughter about something her mother, Fanny, saw one night. Fanny wandered down the stairs and saw her father with one of his dearest friends and a group of African American men and a woman with a child. The next morning, when she questioned her mother about what she'd seen, all she was told was that those people were in terrible trouble and she wasn't to say anything to anyone. Helping runaway slaves was risky business, fines and jail time, not to mention the consequences of being labeled an anti-slavery sympathizer. But Michael and his family continued to take this risk, housing free blacks in cabins on their property and doing their part to aid in others' escape to freedom. Since the Underground Railroad was such a risky and secretive business, history on it can often be contradictory and confusing. Much like the idea that quilts were hung on fences to show a home was there for safe passage. In a lot of cases, uh, some of the people said, no, that's not true. Uh, but what we've sort of discovered in doing a little research, some of the people in that, that it probably wasn't true in some places, but in other places it was. Mm. Uh, it wasn't universal. And I think that's basically what we try to tell people is that, yeah, we don't know that they hung a quilt here. They may not have. But that's another part of the story of the history of the Underground Railroad on how you know, runaways could actually go to a house and know that with that quilt, you would, you would it would be a safe place to go. The home itself is a historical marvel all on its own. You could tell Michael was wealthy by several things. The windows, the amount of the windows in the house, and then the size of them. They weren't small, they were larger windows. Uh, getting glass was not like getting it from Window World. Mm -hmm. You had to go out east and bring it back, and it was, it was delicate to get it here. Uh, the bricks, normally brick houses were built two bricks thick. This house is built three bricks thick. So um, the other thing that's uh, significant, I don't know if you saw, you saw when you came in, and there's a spider, uh, you saw when you came in um, the logs sitting up there. Those aren't ours, but somebody's logging over there. Those are walnut logs. If you look at them when you go out, they're, they're dark on the inside, those are walnut logs. Right now you're standing on walnut logs uh, that were cut on this farm uh, and used as uh, floor joists. Uh, they're logs, they're not, they're not, uh, uh, they're not beams, you know, they're boards. They're, they're logs with bark on them. And they're running from there to here. They run this way on that. They, uh, now, the new part has regular uh, studs in, for the walls and they, it also has floor joists. These are floor joists, our logs, and it also your ceiling. They've done their best to keep the inside as close to its original period as possible. Most of the pieces are from the 1860s, or at least around there. Some have been acquired at auctions, but others have been gifted to them by private individuals, like this petticoat mirror. This is a real old petticoat mirror, and I don't know if you know what a petticoat mirror is, mm -hmm. but back then, as a lady going out in town, you had to make sure your petticoat was not showing or, you know, you were, mm. <laughs> And so, uh, what, two years ago we got this, or three? Yeah, two and a half, three years ago. Yeah. Um, but I want you to notice uh, all the beautiful, beautiful woodwork that was done at the top and they've painted in with gold, so it, it's very special. And down at the bottom is a silver tray. Well, when they came to, somebody would come to call, say you weren't here or you were in bed or sick or whatever. Well, they would come in the front door, leave their calling card in the little tray. And then when you came back home, you knew that they had been here and that they were interested in talking with you. It's easy to walk through old homes like this and ooh and ah over some of the things you see, like these bed warmers but docent Barbara Salter wants to be able to educate people on why these things were in the home in the first place and what life may have been like back in the 19th century. See how this turns? Uh -huh. It's actually for holding an qu extra quilt. Roll the quilt up on there, so if you don't need it, then they roll it up. And then when Isn't that it gets cold the night, it gets cold, they pull, they pull the quilt right off of the roller and it flops right down on top of it. I said I needed it. Can you demonstrate how they use this? Well, first of all, they've had to put You'd have to get coals uh, from your fireplace. Mm -hmm. Then we only have that one on here. Normally there would be another one under here. And you would put it under there to warm the bed oh, below. The Usually the kids get it and adults can't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's because they do those. 
you wanna try? Have you ever wondered where the phrase sleep tight came from? Well, these beds tell the story. The mattress rests atop ropes that would be tightened before bed, but come loose as the night went on. And to think I thought it meant to get comfortable in your thick, cozy blankets with your fancy adjustable mattresses. Something else I found fascinating were these quilts. All different kinds of fabrics, a little of this, a little of that, all three of them do. Well, those would be called utility quilts because they're using up whatever they're ready to throw out. It might be clothing, aprons, you know, uh, might be sheets, it could be almost anything. And they put those blocks together and they became quilts. And this one with only two colors was much more expensive because it was made using fewer fabrics. Joni B and I personally love the multicolor quilt more. Which one do you prefer? <laughs> Back before he was president though, he was just a senator in Illinois at the time oh. of this and then became president. And currently our Lieutenant Governor, literally right before the shutdown of COVID came here and visited. Oh, and she read uh, Henry's Freedom Box to a bunch of children. After an absolutely fascinating tour of Woodlawn Farm, it was time to head back to Blessings to freshen up for dinner at Leo's Pizza. Uh, we've been here actually 42 years, and we came in 78, and uh, just a little tiny little place, little by little we, we expanded. And we're on the third generation, my father, and then us, now my children, and uh, my grandbaby's still not old enough to do this. But. And we're just really proud that everything is made from scratch. Our dough, our sauces, everything is made from scratch. And uh, we've just, we've expanded little by little. We have a courtyard outside and stuff like that. And But our main thing is mainly because our pizza is made from scratch and everything is 100%, no preservatives, no anything. And I think that's why we're so successful. The menu is filled with delicious house-made favorites. We opted for a sampler platter for an appetizer with mozzarella sticks, fried ravioli, fried cauliflower, and fried mushrooms. Antonia also brought out a sample of their tortellini and pink sauce. This was so yummy. Then we had a sampling of pizzas. Gwen and Joni B both ordered their traditional hand toss pizza with various toppings. I ordered a calzone, but before it came out, Antonia brought one of their signature stuffed crust pizzas, which knocked my socks off. So by the time my Kelzone made it out, we had a problem. I'm full. <laughs> but of course I made room for a delicious cannoli. But everybody we have back there, our waitresses for example, Delaney, she's been here for many years. And she looks really, really young, but she's like 20 something, but uh, she's been here for many years. We've had other waitresses have been over 15 years. They're all from town. So everybody's local, everybody. Keep it in the community. You give back what they give you. Y'all, this was our last night. We couldn't believe it. We'd had such a whirlwind few days, and at this point, none of it felt real. In honor of our last night, Miss Gwen of Blessings on State allowed each of us to get a 30-minute massage from Hannah of Juniper by Hannah Pate. So tell me about you, Hannah. Yeah, so I've been a massage therapist for 11 years. I've been an esthetician for a few years now. Um, I worked for the Four Seasons mm -hmm. Spa in Seattle for many years um, and decided to uh, leave and start my own business and move to Jacksonville. So I moved from Seattle to Jacksonville at the very end of January. Wow. So obviously when COVID happened, that kind of slowed me down, didn't mm -hmm. stop me, just slowed me down. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been getting really positive reviews. I got one really sweet long email from uh, a client just saying, you know, thank you so much for coming to town, like your mm -hmm. services are needed and really appreciate what you offer and I've gotten really positive feedback. There's not a lot of massage therapists around this area and mm -hmm. so I think people are really happy to have uh, facials, massages, body treatment options without having to drive. Massages are a very personal and intimate experience, but since you're on this journey with us, we pretty much share everything with you. It was an absolutely incredible massage and the perfect way to cap off our trip to Jacksonville. Okay, hi. Um, so you're probably wondering why I'm in a robe. 
maybe you're not maybe i ended this with the other clips before but thank you so much to miss gwen at blessings on state for getting joni b and i two 30 minute massages one for each of us joni b is over there now with miss hannah getting her massage i just got done with mine and i did record it so you can see just a little bit of what the massage was like it can be done in your room but we actually had ours done in a separate room because we have a lot going on in this room right now. But I just wanted to hop on and say, it was amazing. I will have, as usual, everything linked below so you can check out Hannah's information and all of that. But, oh my. I am somebody who's had massages before, but they're not my favorite because I'm so weird about touch, physical touch. In my daily life, I'm just not a touchy-feely person usually. I'm generally very uncomfortable with that. And so when it comes to a massage, to me it feels very vulnerable. And I lay on the table and I'm constantly thinking like, oh my gosh, they're gonna think I'm disgusting. Like today I didn't shave my legs. And so I'm like, oh my God, she's having to massage my hairy legs. This is awful. I'm probably the most disgusting client she's ever worked on. Which, reality check, probably not what they're thinking honestly they work with the human body every day they probably really don't care but that's always what I'm thinking about so I can never really relax in a massage because I'm constantly thinking oh gross she's having to touch that oh my, I'm so disgusting um maybe you're not like that which is great um but the whole point of all that information was to say even though it was still uncomfortable at points for me the massage itself was so wonderful I carry so much tension in my shoulders. I'm always hunched over a computer. And so I just like carry everything up here. And she really dug in there. Did it hurt? Yes. Was it amazing? Yes. It felt so, so good. So thank you so much, Hannah. You gave me the best massage I've ever had. And I cannot wait to come back to Jacksonville so I can get another one because that was amazing. That's linked below and um, now I really need to pack but what I'm probably gonna do is sit over there on that bed in this robe and do absolutely nothing so um let's get to that shall we I also can't see a dang thing I got all my glasses on whoa hi I'm glad, my bed. I'm glad I didn't wash my hair today because I have a massage oil all up in there thank you about took down all the fall decorations off the mantle. <laughs> I better go down breaking things. And just like that, three days in this incredible town slipped through our fingers. We'd eaten our way through Jacksonville, shopped at pretty much every boutique downtown, and experienced some of the most historical places they had to offer. All thanks to our sponsor, the Jacksonville Area Convention and Visitors Bureau, and Miss Gwen from Blessings on State, who found us in the first place. We hope you've enjoyed this three-part documentary series as much as we enjoyed making it, and half as much as we enjoy Jacksonville. This place changed us, y'all. These people are so passionate about their town, and rightly so. Many of them aren't even from Jacksonville, but they've adopted it as their own, and they'll do whatever it takes to help it grow and thrive. As we left Blessings, Miss Gwen thanked us for coming, and her eyes filled with tears. She said, this is my town, and these are my people. Joni B and I cried in the car on the way to our next stop. Because after just three days, we feel like these are our people too. They welcomed us with open arms and showed us their town with more passion and zeal than we've ever seen from anyone. We were running around all day with our cameras, but the people of Jacksonville, probably unbeknownst to them, filled us with so much joy and love. We felt like we belonged there. They didn't know us, but they trusted us with their stories, and we can only hope we did them justice. Thank you again to the Jacksonville CVB for sponsoring this series and to all the people we met in Jacksonville. You're all remarkable. Thank you for letting us in. And we hope this series inspired you to visit Jacksonville for yourself. It's worth the drive. It's worth the flight. It's worth the trip. These people will welcome you like no one else. No matter who you are or where you come from, this is your town. These are your people. So welcome to Jacksonville. I promise you, you are never going to want to leave.